Hello and welcome to our webcast. My name is Amy Ricca and I will be your host for today. One of Cynthia's primary goals is to advance the media and entertainment industry by providing knowledge to individuals to help them expand their careers and future-proof the organizations that they work for. Cynthia also partners with and supports other organizations which recognize the importance of education and professional development. We are proud to produce today's webcast in partnership with SID, the Society for Information Display. It's my pleasure to introduce Cherie Peruvemba. Cherie is a board member and chair of marketing for SID, as well as CEO and of Marketer International. Cherie is an industry veteran with a successful tenure at notable display manufacturers such as Standish Industries, Planner, Sharp, E-Ink, and Clear Ink. If you have any questions today as we go through the presentation, and if you would like Cherie to respond, please just type them in the question box and I will announce them so Cherie may address them. Without further ado, please welcome Cherie. Thank you so much, Amy. Uh, are you able to hear me okay? I hear you, yes. Perfect. Um, so let me, before um, uh, getting started with the main topic for uh, this webinar, uh, I'd like to say something briefly about SID, uh, the organization. Uh, it's an international organization focused on displays. Uh, typically, the uh, audience that uh, uh, participate uh, with an SID have tended to be scientists and engineers and so on, but much more um, uh, recently, we've had a lot of business people, startup companies and so on that joined the society. We've got chapters in 17 countries, uh, over 5,000 members. We organize various types of events. The Display Week event is coming up next month, and uh, which is one of the reasons why we are doing this webinar at this time to sort of uh, not only provide some uh, education on uh, different types of display technologies used in uh, different applications, but also allude to the upcoming conference. We publish a magazine uh, that uh, covers uh, various different display technologies. And uh, this is one of these most respected organizations in the area of uh, uh, display technology. And it aligns very well with SIMTI and the work that uh, uh, is done within that organization as well. With that, let me get started. Um, I'm going to talk about 10 different trends that I have been observing uh, in the uh, area of displays. And um, this is not necessarily an official version uh, for SID. Uh, this is just my personal observation, having been in the industry kind of forever. And uh, so uh, let's start with the very first one. The first one is artificial intelligence. And uh, hopefully this doesn't come as any surprise to anybody that um, this has uh, been the subject of discussion for the last few years. It's picked up a lot of um, uh, momentum recently, maybe in the last three years or so. So if you go to events such as CES, you notice a lot of um, activity around this. So what has that got to do with displays? So what we've noticed is um, if you take example of um, a device, whether it's made by Amazon, like the Echo or uh, the Google device and so on and so forth, um, they've historically not had a display in them. So you uh, communicate with them verbally and you, you get responses back, but there's no confirmation. And so uh, after doing some research, they've determined they need a display that makes that experience that much more better. So the picture that I've got on the left uh, is an example of a display um, that um, can sort of reconfirm some of the things you're asking. Because as humans, uh, you know, just verbal communication is not adequate for us. Uh, that's why even in this webinar, you've got my audio, but you also see my slides. It just enhances our communications uh, much better. And particularly for those of us that didn't start with English as our primary language. Uh, I was in Brazil last week uh, giving a talk and uh, uh, they were live translating. And I realized in spite of that translation, people were still looking at me and uh, uh, and also looking at my slides because that's how we communicate, uh, you know, enhanced information, visual, audio, and so on is very important. Um, so I'm gonna pause after each of these trends that I observe. And they're not in any particular order. Um, it does not mean that um, uh, you know the artificial intelligence is the most important trend or anything like that. These are just top 10 trends. 
and uh, if there are questions i'll take them or i can continue on and I also make available time at the end to answer questions and then i'm also available after this webinar by email or by phone if uh, there's further questions on any of these subjects so i'm going to pause for a moment if there are no questions uh, and i will um, assume that amy will tell me if there are any otherwise i'll go to the next slide Sure, we do have one question so um there's a lot of discussion about this in particular and the question is, are people really using AI and machine learning? And can you provide some examples? Um, sure. So uh, I mentioned to you that last week I was traveling in Brazil. And um, so a, a colleague of mine who's actually a journalist from um, Connecticut, uh, he was in town. He was going to stay a couple of extra days. And what he uh, showed me on our drive to the, uh, to the facility was um, he's got uh, the um, Google Assistant uh, feature on his phone. So he will literally Google Translate. He will ask a question and it will automatically translate into Portuguese. What was interesting was when he used it at dinner time, um, pretty much everybody also wanted to see the display. They just did not want the phone to just say the, the question in Portuguese, but also show the display, which was very interesting. And I had something similar as well. Uh, which was I wanted to ask them uh, because I had noticed uh, on the roadside there were these large fruits they're called jackfruit and um, I asked the person that was driving and he had no idea what a jackfruit was so the best way was I went online um, uh, you know picked up a photograph of a jackfruit and showed it to him and I think there are many many ways by which we use uh, these types of features and uh, they're being automated and um, uh, for example, in the translate facility, you get a local translation on the phone and then it goes up on the cloud and just improves that uh, and makes it much better. Uh, so I think it is uh, definitely being used. Okay, if there are no other questions, I'll go to the second trend. Yeah, you can go ahead. The second that uh, we notice uh, is robotics. And, um, uh, you know, I have in general noticed there are two kinds of robots. Uh, one is that uh, looks like a machine. The other one tries to resemble a person. And uh, in case of the ones that resemble a person, they try to put a display to depict the face. So you can, um, you know, see a, a little bit more of um, sort of what we would call expressions. Uh, depicted on that screen. And I'm sure every one of you have seen something like this. I've got a couple of images, one that I took at CES, and there's one just below that that has um, a display that uh, uh, sort of replaces a head, if you will, and um, it shows you a lot of information. Because we, can, we, we find that when you um, communicate with the robot, just like in the previous example, you can just verbally communicate with it, or, or you can do this, uh, we are the display, and I, I think this is a uh, trend that will continue. Um, I used to live in Portland, Oregon many years ago, and I remember Alaska Airlines was one of the first ones to deploy self-service kiosks. And I worked for a display company that supplied the displays to them. And um, I remember a lot of people saying, why do we need this? I mean, the Portland airport wasn't very big then. And relatively speaking, it's still not that big compared to some of the other major airports. But, you know, and there were enough people to take care of um, all of the travelers. But as soon as they introduced those kiosks, um, a vast majority of people, including myself, um, started using them because we, you know, we prefer uh, certain things done through machines rather than interact with the human. Uh, and I think this trend will continue. Uh, it, it, I think uh, there are lots of applications where robots will uh, play a major role. And in case of these robots, um, uh, the, the having a display embedded in them uh, just absolutely enhances that communications. And I think this will create a new set of display technologies that will go into robots. Uh, today, we are just using general commercial grade displays into this. My feeling is that will change. Um, uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, a simple reason would be if, if you look at the picture, the second picture, uh, there is a robot that's uh, on wheels and as it moves, there's going to be bump and vibration and the display has got to be robust in order to take care of it. And, and similarly, um, 
there are features in the display uh, that are relevant. For example, in a robot, typically you wouldn't expect to touch the screen, meaning you won't put a touch sensor on it. You could, but you know, it, it would be much more of a uh, audio communications with the robot, but you will get responses both through the display as well as uh, verbally. So I'll pause here and then uh, see if there are any questions. Shuri, um, we have a question. In countries with larger populations, does it make sense to adopt robotics? Um, so, so I have traveled in China recently for a fundraising uh, activity. And I, uh, I've noticed that even in China, they have a lot of kiosks. And uh, my belief is uh, robotics will uh, be very relevant in places where humans don't want to do a certain type of task. And I don't think it, it is necessarily uh, uh, the case where there is a greater population, whether it's in India or China or somewhere else versus uh, a, a country like Costa Rica that has a population of 5 million people. I think um, uh, uh, I think ro robots will be prevalent anywhere where humans don't want to do a certain type of job. Uh, if you think of, uh, it, you know, this is an, a much older movie. Uh, this is a Charlie Chaplin movie where he was um, tightening a couple of bolts, right? That's all he did morning to evening. And when he was done with the job, his hands would continue <laughs> doing the same motions. Those are the kinds of jobs that nobody wants to do anymore. Uh, whether there are certain repetitive tasks in a factory floor, um, whether it is um, mostly cleaning type jobs, those kind of things. And then there are other tasks where, uh, as soon as I say it, you, you will agree that uh, a robot makes perfect sense, which is in the military. Let's say you're diffusing a bomb uh, when, when you're in the battlefield, or uh, you know even um, uh, within the city, if there are a terrorist threat and you're trying to diffuse a bomb, they, we already use robots for those kind of purposes. And um, and then there are many others. Uh, there's a company, iRobot, in the Boston area uh, that used to make a robot that will clean um, gutters in, in on the roof. Uh, and the, these are types of jobs that we humans don't prefer to do or they're dangerous to do. And I think the, those types of applications, we will see a lot more uh, robots. Thank you. Okay, I will go to the next one, which is ARVR. Um, so this is a trend that uh, we've noticed, particularly in the electronic display industry. Um, and in some industries, they feel like it's a fad, but I believe this is uh, here to stay. Uh, let me talk a little bit more about VR. Uh, today, you have a headset and you immerse yourself into a, either a game or an activity or visiting someplace, whatever it is that you're doing, the display becomes one of the most important aspects of this particular application. Um, we had a speaker from uh, Google uh, recently, a very senior person that said, you know, it's all about a lot of pixels. The more pixels you have, the better the experiences. And Google is working on um, some collaborations with display manufacturers to create some of those technologies that don't exist today. So you're building some unique displays for uh, virtual reality headsets. Now, um, I have worked very closely with uh, a couple of companies that are taking this to the next uh, step, which is you've got good visual, you've got pretty decent audio, but there's no touch. So they're building gloves where once you wear these gloves, um, these gloves have both sensors and actuators in them. So um, not only do you see um, everything, but you can also touch and feel and so on and so forth. And these types of things uh, are making a big difference in a number of applications uh, where um, experiencing something in the virtual environment makes more sense. And obviously entertainment makes perfect sense. Um, and you combine display technology with uh, very good audio and, uh, and then uh, the touch then you know it doesn't feel like it's virtual anymore, and that is a, a definitely an emerging trend in uh, for the display industry. Uh, I'll pause for any questions. Shree, um, could you explain how some of the travel applications of VR? 
Um, sure. Um, um, so in, um, in the travel applications, um, just like uh, you know, in, in real estate and some others, um, sometimes you physical, physically cannot be at a certain place. Uh, to give you an example, um, let's say um, we all make a list, a sort of bucket list, if you will, of the places we want to see in the next, say, 10 years or 20 years, whatever uh, uh, amount of um, uh, duration that we have in our um, uh, estimation. And it is quite possible that we may come up with 50 places, but we may really only be able to go to 10 or 12 or 15 or whatever number of there. So by that definition, all the others on that list, you're just not going to be able to make it. But you could technically um, don a virtual reality headset and go there right now. Uh, I'll give you an example. Let's say you wanted to go see the Taj Mahal in India, and that is not a uh, you know, high priority on your bucket list. And what you could do is literally you could uh, uh, immerse yourself into this experience where you'd be in front of the Taj Mahal. You could be in anywhere in the Taj Mahal, including inside that, uh, 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 that monument and see everything. But now, not only have, do you have a great visual experience, um, you can also touch. So if you're wearing the right uh, gloves that have sensors and uh, actuators, and you can literally feel the marble surface of, um, uh, of the Taj Mahal. And, um, and then uh, from a display perspective, when the Taj Mahal was first constructed, to give you an idea, that was constructed about the time the Mayflower landed in the US. So it's a pretty ancient structure. Um, and they had these, uh, this um, uh, monument was filled with rubies and diamonds and all kinds of stuff. And eventually, uh, you know, when, when, uh, when India was um, occupied for many, many um, uh, centuries, uh, even common soldiers gouged out most of those jewels and so on. But the few that remain, the guides would show you, they will, you know, shine a flashlight and see that. And you can literally experience that in a virtual reality headset. It's still not quite there, uh, you know. That's why we like to physically visit these uh, rather than um, try to replicate that experience through a virtual reality headset. But a great display will give you a great experience. And uh, uh, that's why I believe this is one of these trends in display technology that will um, make virtual reality uh, uh, and even augmented reality a, a, a growing area. Okay, uh, any other questions or shall I go to next point? You can go to the next slide. Okay, the next one uh, is sort of near and dear to my heart, uh, electronic school books. I spent, uh, gosh, uh, well over 10, 12 years going around the world talking about this subject and it is just happening now. So, um, the, the 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 premise is that um, uh, you know parents and educators want uh, their kids to have access to knowledge anywhere at any time, and um, uh, so it's not just that um, children in remote parts of the world don't have access to good content, um, but they also have a another issue, which is um, let's say you're a teacher um, uh, that um, uh, you know got training and you're in a little town or a village. A lot of teachers don't want to live there. They would rather move to the uh, city where they can make more money. And this is a trend pretty much across the world, whether it is in the US um, or whether it is um, uh, in, uh, in China. And so this deprives the kids that live in those remote parts uh, of the world uh, access to information. So uh, when you look at what they're using today, they're using books. And we all love books. For those of us that grew up with paper books, we love them. But by the time a book is published and it's in the hands of the students, a lot of times they're obsolete. Um, so think of it uh, this way. The author takes sometimes many years to research a subject and then takes another year to publish and print and so on. And um, while it's fine for math or certain types of uh, sciences, um, it, it is um, no longer relevant for technology, for example, uh, like this uh, trend um, presentation that I'm doing. Let's say six months from now or a year from now, um, this is going to change. It's not going to remain the same 10, right? Some of these will drop off and others will replace them. And that's how it's always been. It'll always be like that. 
um, even uh, with this presentation, as I was um, putting this together, there was a trend that I was thinking whether I should insert or not, which has to do with flexible and foldable displays. Then I said, nah, it's not quite there yet. So I'll, I'll wait for the next time to update. So these types of trends, you're never going to be able to uh, teach kids um, by printing books uh, and so on and so forth. So um, in China, at least, I, I've uh, um, been researching this quite a bit. They're taking a leading role in this, what I call electronic school books. So there are well over 100 companies pursuing this. Um, and uh, this is a big deal uh, for uh, parents that want to make sure their kids are not left behind just because they live in these geographies where they don't have access. For example, MIT has an open courseware program where you can access their content. But if a child in, say, um, um, say in some remote part of Europe wants access uh, to this content, today it is not easy. Uh, to some extent, it is possible through laptops and and uh, and, and uh, tablets and so on. But those have other issues uh, because we use emissive displays, and those have problems on their own. And so, with that, there is a um, growing trend to um, uh, provide electronic school books worldwide, um, and and so the kids have access to best information, best content. Um, uh, content that is um, uh, approved by their respective school districts and uh, it makes it a lot easier for the teachers to teach them. It's not just that access to content loan, but I have been in classrooms where people, uh, the teachers use these uh, devices and you find that you can easily isolate the kids that don't follow along and be able to give them additional guidance and coaching, whereas today you don't have that ability to do that very well with uh, just printed uh, paper. And of course, there's another issue which is um, there are literally tens of millions of trees chopped down every single year to make school books alone. Uh, forget about all other types of paper, just school books alone. And China uses roughly 9 million trees a year for school books. I'm sure it is about that same number in India and uh, um, probably, you know, that many um, trees in uh, Europe uh, in, in North America and elsewhere. And so we are talking about, you know, substantial number of trees that are chopped down every year that could uh, literally stop if uh, the kids start using electronic school books. I'll pause here and uh, wait for any questions. You have a question. So how do we protect viewers from myopia? For example, kids in the U.S. are given iPads to use for all homework and schoolwork, but has there been any research about the consequences? Yeah, so... Uh, what is interesting is that uh, if you see the po uh, picture that I have uh, uh, on my slide, it talks about keep myopia away, go outdoors and play. This is a poster from Singapore. Um, what we found is in China, in Singapore, and Korea, these three for sure, maybe there are other countries. If you look at the um, incidence of myopia or short-sightedness among children at the age of 18, that is roughly at about 90%. Uh, and it's actually higher than 90%, at least in these three countries. And it's growing, uh, I'm told, in pretty much all parts of the world. Uh, I don't know what the number is for North America, um, but it's certainly not um, the same as it was, say, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. In these three countries, that number used to be 15, 20%, say, 30 years ago. And that has grown drastically. And there are many reasons attributed to that. One of them being children spend more time indoors. And so going outdoors, the belief is that your eyes will adjust to far off and near uh, objects. When the, uh, the muscles go, uh, you, you know, start looking at objects far away as well as close by, the muscles uh, are working and that will prevent myopia. That's one of the theories. The other is our kids use a lot more of the LCD uh, screens uh, and, uh, you know, they keep them too close to the eyes and that could also potentially contribute to this. And we also know that if you look at any of the newer LCD devices, we have a blue filter that the industry recommends and you can just, uh, I've got a blue filter on my phone and my laptop and so on. And we know that for a fact that blue light is not necessarily good for you. So, Particularly for little kids, this is very important. And uh, um, so a, a, there's, there's a trend to create uh, electronic paper, uh, which is a reflective display technology 
um, that has, um, so think of the Amazon Kindle as an uh, electronic uh, paper um, display. Now that is usually monochrome and it will not do video, but the need in these uh, school books is to offer color. So more information can, can, can be conveyed as well as offer video so they can play, uh, say the Khan Academy videos. Um, so therefore they, the kids can have access to that kind of information in different uh, forms. So uh, it, it en enhances their learning as well. One more question, Sri. Um, we haven't heard about, we heard, haven't heard very much about this here in the US. Um, do you know why that might be and why, why it's more something that's happening abroad? Um, I, my belief is that uh, when a problem reaches a tipping point where it becomes a national emergency like it is in Singapore, then the government stay, uh, pay attention and do something about it. Um, there are adequate number of articles in um, uh, tier one publications about this problem in North America, but um, I don't really see any broad based initiatives to change this. The industry has taken notice by putting this blue filter and there are even stories about uh, CEOs of some of these largest companies that make these devices that never allowed their little kids to <laughs> use their own devices until they went to, uh, to say high school or something like that. And this is one of the problems. Yeah, I notice that uh, a lot of parents these days uh, allow their uh, toddlers to have a phone or a tablet or something just to keep them occupied because parents need a break, right? But the question is, is that the best way to, um, uh, to, uh, you, to do it? Meaning we know for a fact that some of these emissive uh, display technologies, whether it's a backlight shining through an LCD or an OLED screen, all will impact your eyes. A simple example would be if you try to read a book using an LCD or an OLED screen uh, at night and it, it'll, the, the amount of time it takes for you to go back to sleep uh, is going to be much longer than if you read a paper book or if you read a book on, say, uh, a reflective display like the Kindle or so on. So this is a genuine issue and you can instantly, it, like literally you can try it tonight if you haven't. and. Uh, uh, it'll, it'll show you there's a difference. Exactly how much that impact is, I really don't know. And I haven't seen a whole lot of ophthalmologists come out and say, don't use these types of displays, use these types uh, for your eye health. Uh, maybe they do, and but it hasn't been very popular in the US. At least it's not in the mainstream yet. Interesting. Uh, clearly, though, in China, they're taking notice and the government is doing something about it. Uh, I won't be surprised if China comes out and makes a you know, policy about banning certain types of devices in schools, particularly in uh, elementary schools. Mm, but, uh, you know, uh, they have a more centralized way to communicate with their um, uh, population than we do, whether it's here or other countries in the world. So we don't have any other questions for this slide, so I, I think we can move on. Okay. Thank you, um, So the next one is automotive. Um, here, uh, particularly in the display industry, this is one of the hottest fields in the display industry, it seems like. Historically, the display industry didn't pay as much attention to automotive because there was a, a display, maybe there were two, they were usually rectangular, They and then, you know, for a given model of automobile, you never really sold a whole lot, right? If you sold, you know, um, a couple of tens of thousands of um, displays uh, for a particular model uh, in a particular geography, that would be about the most that you would do. Whereas display manufacturers like to sell a larger displays, obviously more real estate, more money for them, as well as uh, more volume. So automotive wasn't very interesting, but that changed a few years ago. You're seeing a lot of changes in the automobile industry, not just uh, cars like the Tesla, uh, electric vehicles, uh, vehicles that uh, are now the designers in the car industry are insisting that if you look at that image in the bottom, you see how nicely that um, uh, dashboard is contoured um, by the designers. Now you're gonna take that beautiful design and you're gonna interrupt it very rudely with a rectangular display. That's what we do today, right? You literally look at any one of your cars, um, they, they have a rectangular display. In, in the, even in the first example that I've got the Tesla Model 3, 
it looks like it, it looks like a monitor, right? It's, it's a rectangular display. However, there is a trend to make conformal displays. There's a trend to make displays that are curved um, and uh, flexible that could go into automobile applications and uh, and then um, preserve the beautiful design within um, uh, the automobile. That's one trend. The other interesting thing that we notice is uh, as we tend towards these autonomous vehicles, uh, you would no longer need a display in front of the driver. The Tesla Model 3 is already like that. You just look at that image, there's no display in front of the uh, driver, at least directly in front. There's a display to the right and where you typically have a, a GPS type um, uh, display. That's where that monitor is. That's where all the controls are. I think we're already tending towards this. I also think that we will have larger displays in uh, automobiles going forward where the role of the display will change from merely GPS or providing information to providing entertainment, doing other things. Um, as if we truly get into a um, autonomous vehicle um, uh, infrastructure where the, 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 they become very prevalent, uh, I think um, uh, you know we may not have a steering wheel. We would not need one, I guess. Uh, we would uh, essentially have larger displays that we will use as an office. So if you have a longer commute, like I live here in the Bay Area, uh, not far from San Francisco, and for us, a typical one-hour commute in the morning is not unusual. And so you can use it one hour very productively uh, if you you treat your car like a, an office. Uh, it's not quite there yet, but I think this is where it's trending. In the meanwhile, pretty much every single um, manufacturer of um, automobiles have uh, emphasized a, a change in the way they are going to use displays. They're going to use more displays for sure. They're going to use larger displays for sure. And uh, all of these trends are making automotive one of the hottest uh, areas for uh, electronic displays. Sure, so we have question yes have there be a, been any advances in virtual windshields in terms of their wider use there are several companies working on this but any research on which system is better for the driver any current display requires you to take your eyes off the road uh, so this is uh, uh, the uh, projecting something onto your um, uh, windshield has been something that's been around for a long time Unfortunately, those te display technologies were never really very good. I, in fact, had the opportunity to work on one of them, gosh, like 10, 12 years ago. Um, these were micro displays and they were um, other kinds of display technologies that would uh, use the uh, front uh, windshield as a, a screen um, to project images. And I still see them in certain types of automobiles. For whatever reason, they have not taken off and I believe that uh, uh, will will be a trend that we will see much more as uh, some display technologies improve, particularly because uh, of the, you know, you alluded to that in the question, which is uh, if you take the example of the Tesla car that I've got in that picture, uh, to see the display, you have to move your eyes to the right and kind of somewhat to, uh, to the side and, and slightly tilted up depending on what part of the display you're looking at because that's still a very large display. And this is definitely distracting. And uh, I have driven this particular car and I know that it is a, a, a literally a pain. So uh, for example, in this Tesla Model 3, I didn't know how to do the driver assist. Uh, so uh, until I parked, I couldn't figure out. Whereas in the Model X, it's a much easier way to said the driver says is just a knob that you press and it will it, it will do it. Um, so I think the, definitely there is a trend to put displays on the windshield where you, you are looking outside the glass to uh, onto the road or other vehicles and very close to your where you're looking if you can have uh, augmented information whether it's speed whether it is uh, other types of valuable information I think uh, this will definitely happen. Um, I, I personally believe this hasn't taken off in a very big way in the last 10, 12 years is because the technologies were never very good. So one thing, this may be a, a follow up to that question. How do the displays in vehicles today differ from those of 20 years ago? Uh, 20 years ago, we had uh, first of all, most of them were not electronic displays. 
Um, 20 years ago, we were barely into uh, display technology. They were rudimentary. I don't believe there were color displays at that time. We were just starting with color displays. When I say color, uh, multicolor, we, we, you know, there were green displays. Of course, there were vacuum fluorescent displays, which were popular. There were a few LCD, but most LCDs did not survive the automotive environment in the automobile, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, automotive um, uh, industry. They expect the display to work somewhere between minus 30 degrees centigrade to minus 85 degree or plus 85 degrees centigrade operating minus 40 to uh, plus uh, 90 degrees centigrade storage. And lots of LCDs in those days never survived that. So they used vacuum fluorescent. There were some LEDs, but they were rudimentary displays. They'd never had graphic displays. They just had alphanumeric that would show information, either a clock, they would show speed, they would um, show um, the radio um, dial and that sort of thing. They were pretty rudimentary. Uh, so compared to what we have today, today, um, you know, if you look at a, a you know, the um, Tesla Model S or the um, uh, Model X, they have got a 17-inch display. Uh, pretty much, you can, um, you know, it, it, heck, it's even bigger than my laptop, and there's a lot of information that is con con uh, conveyed. And also, there are other aspects of the automobile, whether they are sensors and other information that comes in. All of that makes those displays much more useful. And uh, so I believe that there will be even more displays. Um, Tesla tried to make this with one display, but you, you, you see automobiles like the BMW, um, the uh, newer ones from uh, Toyota, all of those have multiple displays. So they're trying to dedicate a display for a given set of uh, features uh, rather than put everything in one. And that's all the questions I have for this slide. So you can move on to the next, Shuri. OK, thanks. Um, the next trend uh, that I've noticed in the display industry is writing surfaces. And um, so I'm going to give a couple of different examples to explain. Um, my belief is that, uh, that uh, uh, you know, there is a lot of value in uh, analog writing. And um, there, there, there are studies that show that when we uh, uh, write uh, with a pen, uh, we remember much better than when we type. Uh, so if you're in a classroom setting, or let's say you're listening to this uh, webinar, and there are a couple of ways to capture information. Let's say out of these 10 trends that I'm going to talk about, there may be a trend that you haven't heard about, or you either disagree with me, or you agree, but you have a question. When you jot down these things with, with, with the pen, um, uh, the, there is evidence that you will retain that information much better than if you just type it or uh, capture it some other way. And with that, there are a number of companies trying to introduce devices that uh, uh, try to uh, mimic the pen and paper experience. Uh, I've given you two examples here. There are a multitude of examples. Uh, the first example is this company, Remarkable, um, out of uh, Europe. They've got a paper device, paper tablet. Now, why is that different from, say, an iPad or some other uh, tablet-type devices? Because they, they have a, a display technology, electronic paper display technology that resembles much more paper. They've created a unique experience. Now, some of these technologies were never fast enough for you to be able to use a pen, there was always a lag, and they have built something that has reduced that lag to a point where you don't notice it. So uh, the belief is that uh, people like to write, uh, analog writing is making a big comeback. Uh, you also see this in the iPad, you also see this in the uh, Microsoft devices. Uh, although they are LCD, they've also created v very many newer features in those displays to um, sort of reduce your feeling of, hey, I'm writing on, on an LCD versus writing on what looks like paper, or feels like paper, looks like paper, and that kind of thing. So all of these things are converging, and I believe electronic writing will continue to uh, grow in a very big way. <coughs> the second example that I've got here uh, is a company out of Calgary uh, called Quirk Logic, and they have this um, device called the Quilla. And this one is trying to replace the flip charts and whiteboards and those kinds of things and uh, create a collaboration uh, device. 
there, uh, I've had the opportunity to work with this company closely, so I, I, and here's what their CEO typically says. Uh, so if you look at conference rooms that have very expensive audiovisual um, equipment, uh, some of them have a million dollars worth of um, electronic displays, um, audio systems, all of this. Yet when they brainstorm, they still go to the whiteboard. And uh, the challenge with the whiteboard is obviously we love whiteboards. We, you know, we are so used to it, you can just walk up to it and write and so on. Whereas it's much harder to do that with the LCD type technologies where in the past, we used to have these whiteboard replacement products where you got to log on and you write, it doesn't feel like the same and there is heat generated from these displays that you don't want to stand near it for too long. There was a whole host of issues. Um, and that's what they're trying to uh, get rid of and capture the true essence of writing electronically, but you feel like you're writing on paper. Now, it's not just one or two of these. Both of these companies that I just mentioned are startup companies. Whereas larger companies like Google uh, has got a device that they launched, I think a couple of years ago, Cisco has got a device, Microsoft has got, all of them are using LCD technology to build and recreate this writing experience in an electronic medium. So this is another very large trend. I had the opportunity to talk to some of these companies and their products are, are all doing extremely well. Uh, and it's creating a new, um, product category in both in the office as well as uh, in these huddle spaces in these conference rooms and so on where um, we want to collaborate there's another aspect to this which is um, you know our teams are no longer all physically located in the same area so you want to be able to collaborate with somebody in another country so having uh, when you write on these devices if whatever you're writing appears uh, uh, live on their screen whether their screen is their tablet, whether their screen is another device like this and so on, that's very valuable for collaboration purposes and so on. So that is my, my uh, view of this particular market and where the trend is taking this, uh, these types of display technologies into uh, writing services. I will pause if there are questions. If not, I'll move to the next one. Also, the time I think so how about uh, no. I will, for the next few, I will just go through them very quickly and then we'll pause in the end for questions rather than take questions after each slide. Okay, okay. next one is smart surfaces. Um, what I mean by this is there are a lot of surfaces that can have intelligence if you put a display on it and you, you can capture that data, whether it's through sensors, it's through some other mechanism and uh, have that. And here are a couple of examples to explain what I'm talking about. So uh, basically these, these are IoT type um, concept, which is gaining a lot of popularity. Um, uh, yesterday I was talking to somebody that are deploying uh, electronic shelf labels uh, into uh, retail environment. So historically we had paper labels. When you went to a store, uh, the prices were on a little paper labels and that took a long time for these companies to replace. And today with the uh, ability for a shopper to go into a, a store and say, hey, you know what, I, I, I'm going to play with this product and understand the different type. Let's say you're trying to buy a camera. You look at different cameras, you try out all these features, you do all this, and then you say, before I purchase it, this is a big ticket item for me, I'm going to check online to see if any of the online retailers have the same model, same product for a lower price. And this puts your retailer under a tremendous disadvantage because they gave you uh, uh, that experience, you know, you went into their store, they pay rent, they pay for the for the employees, they pay for the electricity, they pay for all this, and you went and experienced all this, yet you bought to an um, to online retailer. So to combat that, they're putting electronic displays, uh, replacing those paper labels where they are able to change prices or match that of the competition and so on and so forth much more easily. So that's one example. The other two examples in those pictures that I have, the first one is a museum in Houston where I, I think this is true for most museums, is a significant portion of the museum content these days are, um, uh, are, are content that uh, sort of um, are a traveling show, if you will. So a given museum will have a, a set of art that you see, and then uh, a month later, that same art will go to another museum, and this museum will replace that portion. So there are exhibits that, uh, there are permanent exhibits, and there are exhibits that, uh, 
are constantly renewed. So for the ones that are renewed, like for example, in this, uh, there's this uh, um, uh, painting there, where uh, you know you typically next to the painting, uh, you have a little placard that explains uh, what the painting is about. Uh, and for guys like me, I actually read the placard much more than just look at that painting, because um, <laughs> the, uh, you know uh, the, there's a lot of information that's conveyed. But you know, imagine you know, replacing that placard every time. And by the way, those are not cheap. Those are expensive to do. There are all kinds of issues. So you could have electronic display, like in this example, there's a little uh, display that um, conveys whatever information uh, about that exhibit. And then when you put a next exhibit or you change it, you just have to change the content electronically, wirelessly, and you have it. And it prevents, uh, in this particular example, it's actually on a magnet and it sticks to that surface. You're not drilling holes. You don't have cables that look ugly and so on and so forth. There's no power cable. There's no data cable. All of this is done wireless. So that's an example. The other example I've got below is uh, a truck. You know, <laughs> the, the, the back uh, of a truck is a pretty much a dumb surface today. And you could put electronic displays like uh, in this particular example, um, these are um, trucks that are being deployed in Germany uh, by a company that uh, has got these tiled displays. And obviously there are regulations. You don't want to run a movie on it. You'll distract the traffic and cause accidents. But just like we have uh, um, uh, electronic displays in the freeways uh, in the US uh, where there are regulations, you can constantly change them. You can't have video content. Similarly, these are also regulated. They can offer very valuable content. They can also offer advertisements that will pay for this infrastructure and so on, but it will also offer very valuable information like, um, you know, uh, um, what's ahead in terms of uh, accidents on the road or uh, detours, construction, so on. Also, missing children, missing vehicles, all kinds of very valuable information can be conveyed. And that, uh, uh, and that's a, you know, a newer trend, and I believe that will grow. And there are other trends where you're replacing displays or replacing paper uh, labels in bus stops and train stations and so on with uh, these smart surfaces. Okay, so I'm gonna go to the next one, which is uh, electronic signage. Um, and here we see a lot of technologies, electronic paper, LED, LCD, are all trying to replace signs that were historically made of paper or plastic or something else. And, um, um, uh, you know, for indoors, we historically used LCD uh, technology for signage, and then outdoors, we uh, predominantly used LED technology. But there is a change. Now, there's micro LED coming into play uh, to offer signage products. Uh, it's obviously an emerging display technology. Uh, Samsung introduced this, uh, the, the image on the top is the Samsung wall. Uh, it's a fairly large uh, display um, that, uh, uh, you know, essentially they, they had it in the backdrop of, of a real wall and they could put an image of the background and try to make the display disappear. Um, and they, they succeeded to some extent. It's not quite there yet, but it, uh, it was a very good uh, way to depict something uh, that uh, foretells the future or where these display technologies might go, which might just blend into the background and offer a lot of information whenever it's required. Similarly, in my example in the bottom, uh, you know, if you go to a lot of these uh, events, where they would have a little paper sign uh, um, uh, pasted on a plastic or a metal uh, structure, uh, like a podium or, a, um, or uh, you know, it's basically on a pedestal, sorry. Um, and these pieces of paper are being replaced by electronic displays. So you could use the exact same thing over and over again uh, in these venues where you have an event, uh, sometimes even multiple times in a day. So uh, these types of areas, the trends in displays are low power so that they are not, um, uh, they can be battery charged and they work for many days um, rather than having to charge them all the time. Uh, and then uh, wireless technology, so there are less cables being used. So that's another trend that uh, is very interesting in the uh, large, uh, large area electronic uh, uh, displays. My trend number nine is wearables. Uh, here, uh, you know, it sort of was very popular a few years ago, and it sort of uh, has died down a little bit, uh, at least in terms of hype. 
uh, which is essentially a good thing because then you can have much more practical um, and useful devices being deployed. Um, so, in, so in this example, um, take a smartwatch, for example. Um, most people use smartwatches, even today, just to count steps, right? Everything else, pretty much a non-smartwatch can do, uh, meaning tell the time. So uh, there are a whole host of features, vast majority of them are gimmicks and they're not very useful. But um, uh, as you put sensors in them and these sensors can, uh, the, that are touching your skin, can evaluate your sweat, uh, they can track your temperature uh, or, or um, count your pulse and so on, they can give you very valuable information. All of a sudden, these devices become very useful. That's what is happening right now in the industry. And uh, for that, you need displays uh, that will com communicate and convey all of this very valuable information. And these displays need to be low power so that these devices can last for a long time. They have to be sunlight readable. Um, they have to also allow you to sh um, um, uh, you know, see a lot of information, whether they're information um, uh, that require a certain speed so you can kind of show video or color and those kind of things. So th those are the trends that I observe. Um, sensors and actuators are also beginning to get into this. And so if you think of wearables beyond smartwatches, you look at wearables like gloves, you look at um, garments and so on, all of them are incorporating sensors. And there is also a request from that industry to put flexible displays on them so that more information can be conveyed. That is not quite there yet, meaning the uh, flexible uh, displays. Flexible displays uh, will first get deployed in other applications rather than wearables. But eventually, um, flexible displays, because they'll be lighter and they can be conformal and they, they, they will have other value, they would get into this area as well. But in the meanwhile, rigid displays have a lot of play. Uh, people are looking for a robust display, something that works very well, can be used outdoors, and, uh, and can work for a very long time on a single charge. So that's the trend that I see in the wearables uh, space for display technology. My last trend, uh, which is probably much more relevant to the SMT um, audience than any other, uh, is TV. Um, so there are two broad display technologies that have been uh, in the uh, dominating the uh, TV application. Um, LCD obviously has the majority share. It's been around for a very long time. LCD replaced CRT, LCD replaced plasma and other technologies. Um, and it's today LCD is the most dominant. Now, uh, for those of you not as familiar with display technologies, if you go to a store today, they talk about LED TV. Uh, first of all, that is a marketing thing. Uh, my counterparts in these um, companies have unfortunately ignored uh, <laughs> ignored the technology and the science and the uh, and the terminology and. Uh, falsely call these LED TVs. There's no such thing as an LED TV. Theoretically, you can make an LED TV. What is sold in the market is all LCD. They just have an LED backlight and they have decided to call them an LED TV in order to differentiate the product from the historical LCD TV. So majority are LCD. There's a lot of um, um, technology improvements in LCD. And in the last few years, OLED has come uh, into play, competing with the LCD to offer some really interesting uh, features. The first example that I've got the picture shows uh, uh, conformal TV. This is made by LG uh, at the CES show. It's literally a wall and you can walk through that corridor. It's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, OLED technology has come in a very big way. The primary advantage OLED offers over LCD is that it's got a tremendous color gamut and uh, the, they all can offer true black and uh, the images are stunning. Now LCD, in order to compete with OLED, where LCD today is significantly lower cost than OLED, but uh, the image quality wasn't as good as OLED. To compete, LCD adapted quantum dots. So if you put a layer of quantum dots, uh, onto an LCD, you can enhance the color gamut so it will compete and match that of OLEDs and give you the same benefits, um, yet you can offer it at a much lower price. 
I had the opportunity to uh, be closely involved as a CEO of an OLED company, or sorry, of a quantum dot company uh, a couple of years ago, and I had an opportunity to see this um, uh, at close quarters. So the quantum dots are, are an emerging trend. There are a number of companies, particularly Samsung, and a few companies in China that have deployed uh, LCD TV with quantum dots, and um, they offer very stunning colors. And if you put them side by side with an OLED, um, the average person will not be able to tell any difference. However, OLEDs primarily promoted by LG and now uh, with some others uh, uh, have always offered um, uh, extraordinary color, but also more recently we see flexible displays, curved displays and so on from OLEDs that is much harder to do with LCD technology. So these are the two and uh, um, you know, obviously there will be other um, technologies uh, coming into play. One of the things that I wanted to mention is um, I had five TVs at home and I disconnected all of them uh, because I don't watch TV in the same way. These were, uh, you know, ranging from, I even had CRTs. I'm a display industry geek, so the TV that I purchased 25, 28 years ago, I retained. At that time, CRT was a dominant technology. And, uh, but these days, pretty much, I consume my TV content through a tablet or mobile phone or some other means. And if I am an, a, a representative of this trend, then TVs in general, at least in North America, um, the traditional TV is not growing. So the TV manufacturers have to create newer technologies in order to revive the growth. However, in China and India and other places, TV continues to grow. And there also, there's a lot of competition there trying to differentiate. And these things I mentioned about OLEDs and LCD and quantum dots, are all definitely in play. And then there's um, micro LED technology and some others coming into play as well to continue to uh, make um, information, content, entertainment, and so on available to us through all these various medium. And no, no matter which one wins, I think we will see a tremendous growth in uh, display technology in the TV applications. So with that, uh, those are my 10 trends and I'll stop now and I'll take questions on either uh, the trend number 10 or any of the previous ones. Shuri, we do have one question um, about Ultimate TV. Can you expand a bit about micro LED? I'm sure. So um, LED technology uh, in, uh, um, in um, displays has been around for a very long time. If you look at Times Square, if you look at uh, the displays in any of those casinos in Las Vegas, the outdoor displays, they're all LED. And um, the challenge with LED is that, you know, if you get too close to them, you'll actually see the devices and you can no longer see the image. So they work very well if you're a little bit further away, um, uh, let's say at least 10 feet away, preferably, you know, 100 feet away, where you will truly be able to uh, enjoy that display technology. But uh, indoors, it's always been LCD. Now there's a trend to bring LED technologies indoors to compete with OLEDs and LCD, both for signage as well as TV. To do that, you have to miniaturize the LED. That's why uh, the name is micro LED. So a lot of these deployments are actually mini LEDs. They're not micro, but now there is a trend to make micro LEDs. A number of companies are working on it. And, um, um, the big trick is how do you get, um, you know, um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even a million of these uh, tiny, tiny um, uh, micro LEDs onto a uh, surface in order to create a display. And that's what people are working on. Uh, I have seen examples of micro LEDs recently that are looking absolutely stunning. So I expect micro LED technology to play a pretty major role in the next few years. Um, at the moment, I see that much more uh, in electronic signage indoors, as well as uh, in, um, in TV type applications. Um, but it is very possible that micro LEDs may get into applications as small as a smartwatch. Are there other questions? That is the last question we have, Shari. Okay, very good. I think we are on time, right? We, uh, we are. We are like right on time. 
And uh, I will go to my last slide, uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, SID, and then also give you my contact information if anybody wants to directly write to me about any of these things. Um, I noticed when I was giving the talk in Brazil, I, uh, about a couple of months ago, I gave a talk about display technology, not this exact subject, a slightly different technology in India. And I noticed, uh, you know, when you're in front of a live audience, a lot of times people don't ask questions. Um, so, uh, but when I provided contact information, I got some questions and, and uh, you know, resulted in some really very interesting back and forth, um, both in terms of um, my communicating information and also learning uh, and people tell me about new stuff. But anyway, um, uh, Display Week uh, is coming up uh, next month. It's May 12th through 17th. Uh, it's literally Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday are the three dates when there is the exhibit and so on. Uh, there are 250 exhibitors. Um, uh, the keynotes will be from Google, Samsung, and BOE. Um, pretty much everybody in the display industry will be there. It's the largest and most prestigious um, display conference is dedicated to display. There's also automotive conference, there's an investors conference, <clears throat> both for startup companies as well as for uh, uh, venture capitalists and other strategic investors. Uh, there's a foldables conference. This is the first time ever that we're doing this where there will be foldable displays being uh, discussed. Uh, iZone is an innovation zone where companies that cannot afford to get a booth can apply for free. Uh, to get a space. Uh, unfortunately, the, the deadline is already closed, and uh, um, I am told by the chair of the iZone that we got record number of uh, entries this year, and uh, and that's going to be an, uh, pretty awesome. These are uh, really emerging technologies. And then, uh, I'm a big proponent of women in technology. This is a, a forum that we started about uh, two, three years ago, and I chaired the very first one, and uh, uh, Vice Chair for Marketing Tara Akawan did the last one, and we've already picked the panelists for this year, and that'll be a really awesome. This is sponsored uh, by Microsoft and Clearing, and the CEO forum is something that I'll moderate myself. The CEOs have already been chosen, and we'll be announcing them pretty soon. Uh, this also is a um, a, a, a session that's uh, uh, got sponsorship from Iris Tech. Um, so really very, very interesting um, um, conference. I've been going to this uh, for, this will probably be my 24th year. I think I missed just once. So uh, this is gonna be in San Jose, California. If, um, if you're around, if you're interested, uh, uh, please visit. And for Simti audiences, I'm happy to give a code which will allow you to go into the exhibit area for free for that if you can write to Amy uh, or to anybody at Simti or to myself, I'm happy to provide you with that code. And with that, uh, here's my contact information if uh, you, you have questions um, that you're not able to ask now. Thank you, Sheree, and thank you all of us for joining us today. You can learn more about Simpty webcasts at simpti.org slash webcasts. We also invite you to find out more about our virtual classroom courses including our latest on HDR at simpty.org slash courses. We'll see you next time.